Hello. Um, so our speaker this week is Dr. Kevin Kay. Um, Kevin is from the School of Archaeology and Ancient History here at Leicester. Uh, just for some background, Kevin is a Leverhulme Trust Early Career Fellow uh, and his fellowship is titled Architecture of Dislocation, Neolithic Houses and the Politics of Mobility. Um, as a member of the Material World Research Cluster and the Intersectional Bodies Research Cluster at Leicester, uh, Kevin studies houses and domestic life as drivers of social change. So, um, yeah, in addition to collaborating with architects and archaeologists and uh, land economists, uh, focuses on theory around material culture, new materialism, humanist and post-humanist approaches to social change. So thank you so much for presenting tonight. And uh, we'll pass over to you. Thank you. Uh, is my mic up? Yeah. Uh, good, good. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. I've got a bit of a prologue uh, to this one to get us kind of in the space that I want to think about today. Uh, so an unusual thing happened to me uh, right at the start of my PhD, within a few weeks of starting the PhD. Uh, an experience that hasn't happened much to me since, uh, which is I went to a research seminar like this one and the Q&A afterwards was actually worthwhile. Uh, it was actually very interesting. Uh, the talk was by Matt Edgeworth of US uh, fame. Uh, that year he was field archeologist in residence at the McDonald Institute in Cambridge. Uh, and the talkie game was, uh, talk he gave was about excavations at the town center of Wednesbury. Uh, no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, town center of Wednesbury uh, with the uh, Birmingham University Field Archaeology Unit. Uh, so Wednesbury, they were doing a phase two commercial archaeological survey. They were going to expose a large area uh, and dig a small uh, sample of it down to the natural. Uh, and they went in with a pretty clear plan of how they were going to do that. Uh, so they stripped the topsoil off, and once they'd done that, uh, pretty much immediately things started to go um, not according to that plan. Once they'd removed the topsoil, they found weird linear arrangements of artifacts and inversions of things, older things on top of younger things and uh, stuff like that, things that didn't make much sense. As they went down a little bit further, uh, they realized what had been going on. They thought they were coming down onto a post medieval town center, uh, and actually they were coming down on a 17th century perimeter ditch around the edge of it. And this ditch, uh, really quite big originally, about five meters wide, uh, had pulled all of the surrounding stratigraphy, all the remains surrounding it, down into the channel and rearranged it in odd linear patterns. Uh, so Matt Edgeworth used this case study to ask a, a pretty basic question about what archaeologists do. Uh, he said, is the past a remote reality, something that happened back then and we're just glimpsing it from afar? Uh, or is the past actually a material force that acts on us in our present, that shapes what we know of ourselves in our world uh, through its actual physicality? He says in Wensbury, uh, this was not archaeologists producing the past. Uh, this was the past physically shaping the way that archaeologists executed their practice, shaping the history that ultimately came out of it. Uh, so in the very back row in the far right corner of the room uh, was Chris Evans, then the uh, director of the Cambridge Archaeological Unit. Uh, as the talk concluded, his hand shot up to the roof and he was really not impressed with this line of argument about where the past comes from in archaeology. So it basically turned into one of these memes. Uh, this is a good summary of the Q&A after that talk. Uh, and a summary of it is a little bit like this. Uh, so Chris Evans says, you know, you're talking about it like this ditch made you dig it in a certain way. But you're the ones who decided to dig there. Strata don't dig themselves. Matt Edgeworth responds that, of course, but excava those excavations didn't go according to plan. Arguably, no excavation goes according to plan. 
uh, the past, that physical material from the past actually shapes how we practice archaeology, shapes the history that comes from it. Chris Evans says, but you decided to adapt to the stratigraphy. You could have plowed on with the plan that you had. You chose not to. But they couldn't have plowed on with the plan that they had uh, if there hadn't been a big channel there to adapt around. They would never have planned an excavation like that in absence of that big channel. I don't think they ever would have imagined it in their wildest dreams. Uh, and this last one is, sorry, I'm standing right in the way of it. Uh, this last one is, I think, pretty much a direct quote. Uh, then you might as well credit your shovels with your excavations because you couldn't have dug without them being there either. So like any good debate, there are really important points being made on either side here. And I think to some extent, uh, both of the people in this debate are right. Uh, the past comes from things that have happened uh, that have given shape to our world, that still give shape to our world, uh, and that we have to respond to as people living in it now. The past also comes from the skills and perspectives that we apply as the result of our training, training that allows us to be affected by layering in the dirt and channels that have plowed through stratigraphy in a certain way. Um, that's the training that allows that kind of ditch or whatever remain it is that we're digging to matter to our histories. Um, so we would have gotten a different past out of Wensbury if there was no ditch there in the first place to interrupt their excavation strategy. We also would have gotten a different history out of Wensbury if they'd been trained as antiquarians and had just plowed through with Maddox looking for shiny things. Uh, for some people, the past takes the form of linear bands of earth layered on top of one another, pits cutting through it, things like that. Um, but I don't think it's self-evident to everyone that that is what the past looks like or where the past comes from. Um, I don't think the sort of material force that Matt Edgeworth was talking about, ditches like this exerting in our world, uh, would have worked the same on just anyone. Uh, so what the past can look like in material terms uh, comes from this complicated interface of who we are, what we do, what's out there in the world around us, what we've learned to look for. Uh, and that's the kind of really complicated nexus of past and present that I want to talk about today. Last bit of preface to the talk. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about knowing the past archaeologically, uh, and this is uh, basically what I mean by it. So this is a very fun little book by uh, Philip Boissonneau, who's uh, really agonizing over this question, what is archeological, specifically archeological knowledge about the world as distinct from say historical knowledge or other forms of knowledge we might have about the past? And where he lands with that question is uh, what I put on screen. Archeologists uniquely connect two questions that aren't necessarily obviously connected to one another at all. One of those is a spatial question. It's what is here? What is cutting through what else? What's laying on top of what else? The really fine grained questions that we ask about space as archeologists. And only with archeological training does that become self-evidently also a question about time. What has happened here? And so our archeological training, according to Boissonneau, is a way to allow ourselves to be affected by uh, layers of soil and pits and things like that, uh, to allow those things to not be just dirt, to, but to actually be uh, the materialization of history itself. So the argument, argument I want to make today is that Neolithic people about 9,000 years ago in Turkey thought about the past um, more or less the same way that archaeologists do. This is admittedly a bit of a brave argument. I'm going to be reaching quite a bit here, um, but I hope that even if I don't manage to persuade you that people at Chatelhoyek thought about the past the same way that archaeologists do, uh, that along the way we're going to encounter some really interesting things to think about in terms of how we approach the past in the past and maybe the present, the future in the past and maybe the present and the ways that history kind of gets embedded in a lot of little things that don't necessarily look like history at all. A little bit of context. So we are here uh, 
in the middle of Turkey uh, and in the seventh millennium BC. Uh, so we're right at the edge of the area where farming initially develops in the Neolithic. Uh, and chronologically, we're right about on the edge of where farming is this quirky thing that people in Southwest Asia do. Uh, and when it starts to really spread around Eurasia, spread into Europe and Central Asia and places like that. Chetelhaic didn't always look like this, but this is maybe what it would have looked like at the peak of its occupation. So you have uh, a town in a high altitude wetland, uh, seasonal wetland, uh, mud brick houses, packed together, uh, wall against wall against wall on all sides for the most part. Uh, people move around the site at the roofscape uh, across the roofs of the houses and descend into buildings by ladder from the roof. Uh, very few open spaces in the middle of the mound uh, at its height of occupation around 6600 BC. So in a lot of ways, uh, me being up here talking about uh, the past in the past at Chattelhoyak is about the most unoriginal thing to give a talk on uh, that I can think of. Uh, just about as long as people have been excavating this site, uh, the sheer importance of these people's own pasts to themselves uh, has jumped out at just about everyone who's dug there. Uh, so as we're digging at Chattel, we're constantly finding things like a plastered skull buried with uh, a person, uh, you know, elderly person, much more elderly skull, um, probably decades or centuries older than her uh, in one burial. We get people being buried sequentially in the same burial pit at the base of a platform that's then adorned with a horned pillar, uh, horns coming from a wild oryx that was hunted, probably feasted upon, and it's clearly doing something to mark the spot where those people are buried, as well as probably commemorating uh, that hunt and that feast. Uh, cache of obsidian spearheads. This is actually the whole chaîne operatoire for producing these spearheads arranged in order from uh, cortical flakes all the way down to finished product uh, in a doorway in the newly built house. Uh, People are doing things like this all over the place at Chital, and it's kind of hard to miss the point that they're really into commemorating the past and thinking about uh, the past as they go about their daily lives, marking those spots uh, in very memorable ways. Perhaps the thing that's made most of a splash is just the way that they built those houses in the first place. Uh, so this is a section through the mound. This is a, uh, or through a part of the mound. This is a cake slice. Uh, vertically through it. It's about 15 meters from one end to another to give you a sense of scale. Uh, and these little rectangular forms are, are the houses. Uh, so I've highlighted three uh, very early Chattelhoyak buildings that are built here. Um, and what happens is over time they're lived in uh, for decades. They're torn down, imploded, uh, which forms kind of a platform on which future architecture is built. And they rebuild in place century after century. Uh, that's about 400, 500 years before things start to change a little bit. Uh, so Ian Hodder and Peter Pels have argued that this is evidence of uh, real institutional commitment to these houses, to keeping these houses in place and building up a history in them. As they're rebuilding, they don't just build the walls in the same place. They often keep uh, the internal arrangement of the house much the same. They'll often repeat decorative elements, uh, sculptures like those horned pillars will be repeated in building after building uh, in these stacks for 400 years, which is uh, really crazy to think of people keeping that sort of continuity uh, going. So the idea is that these each stack here is kind of an institution, a history house in, in Hodder and Powell's terms uh, that are competing with one another to try and amass the most compelling history uh, and that much of the site's politics revolves around history. And much more widely in Neolithic Southwest Asia, there are things going on like this, maybe not quite to that same extent, um, but things like uh, settlements centered on mortuary buildings where the dead are buried um, and sometimes maybe produced this uh, plinth that China in the top right uh, has human blood residues all over it. 
um, and we just won't ask how, uh, doing things like body curation, plastered skulls, uh, plaster effigies of human bodies being buried in interesting places, foundation deposits, closure deposits, lots of attention being made to um, moments of transition and uh, often those uh, places where interesting things happen retain significance in communities. So history making is a big deal in uh, just about all Neolithic communities in Southwest Asia, but Central Anatolia is exceptional for kind of the depth and density of the callbacks to the past uh, that we're constantly encountering as we dig at places like Chital. In a lot of ways, uh, this is something that archaeologists have gotten very good at. Uh, talking about the past in the past isn't particularly new now, talking about past people's sense of their own past. Uh, and quite a lot of people in quite a lot of parts of the world have worked on this, uh, and there's some really cool stuff. One of the, uh, one thing about talking about the past in the past, though, is that um, often people talk about it uh, in a kind of ad hoc way around finds, spectacular finds, where the kind of pastness or the historicity of that object is unmissable. So you get a curated object buried in a much later context. You get a monument in the landscape that's reopened, reactivated thousands of years later. You get um, interesting things with dead bodies and questions of ancestry. These things kind of scream something is going on here with people's sense of their own history. Uh, and we tend to build up our sense of the past and the past around really explicit history making practices. And that can produce some really cool stuff. I'm, I'm not criticizing that approach to the past in the past, but I do want to think with maybe Julia Hendon's reminder here that uh, memory isn't its own thing and object of past practices. It's not just something that people very explicitly go out of their way to try to produce. It's also something that emerges from lots of little things that people do in their lives. The little ways that they train themselves like Edgeworth's archaeologists to see history in different kinds of things, to see history in different kinds of places. Um, and so in addition to thinking about the past in the past in situations that scream history to us, we also need to think about the broader fields of practice that people are engaged in and the different ways that they're encountering the material in their world in ways that make particular kinds of history possible. So that's what I want to do for the rest of the talk is think about the different practices, not all of them very explicitly about history that may have attuned people in central Anatolia in the Neolithic uh, to see history. Um, and I think uh, as we'll see with that basic definition of what archeological pasts are, that they link space and time uh, in the way that our field practice does uh, a lot of the things that Central Anatolian people are doing uh, also meet that definition. They link buried space with history. So we can start with plastering. So uh, chattel hay houses were made of mud brick. Uh, mud brick needs to be maintained fairly regularly if it's going to not uh, get really frail, feeble, and, and probably fall down on you. Um, but you really don't need to plaster it four, five, six times a year to keep it fresh. Uh, people at Chital and, and quite a lot of other Central Anatolian Neolithic sites uh, went above and beyond what they needed to do to keep fresh plaster on all the surfaces inside their homes. You get up to about 450 plaster layers. This is a, uh, just a section through it, and I hope you can make out the uh, the hundreds of layers of plaster that have been applied to this wall. Uh, buildings were occupied, depending which carbon dating program you trust, somewhere between 30 and 80, up to 100 years or so. Uh, so 450 plaster layers on one wall means uh, that they're plastering these surfaces quite a lot of times per year. And this means that over time, as people are living in a house, they're adding plaster on all the surfaces and the surfaces get thicker. The floors rise up layer by layer. The walls get thicker and start to sag and 
Uh, if you see old plaster at Chital, it's often very wavy and ripply uh, and, and yeah, saggy is the word for it. Uh, so the space changes and, and the surfaces change. It's almost like a, a rising water sort of situation. And this means that things, low lying things on the floor uh, could be swallowed up by that rising plaster in a way. Uh, if you have things like this is a field sketch of a hearth and you can see these are all the many plaster layers going up along the side. And what they've had to do as the as the floor level rises, they've had to raise this hearth uh, four or five times and ultimately put it up on a little bit of a pedestal to stop it from being uh, subsumed under the floors. And even then it almost ends up at floor level by the end of the house's life. So as people are living in houses over, over the decades that they're alive, they're watching these interiors change quite a bit and they're watching uh, they're probably physically participating in sealing a lot of things under plaster, invisible, but they know that it's buried there. This happened at a much quicker pace when they tore down buildings. Uh, so again, every three to eight decades or so, each building would have been uh, imploded, sometimes immediately rebuilt, other times left open for a while. Uh, and because they're pushing everything in, the roof, the walls, uh, this will have raised that spot in the town by one to two meters every time they do it. Um, and since buildings are being raised in kind of staggered, uh, at staggered timings, it means that gradually and at an uneven pace, different parts of the landscape are going to be rising upwards, ultimately about 14, 15 meters over the time the site is occupied. Uh, this means that older buildings, for example, will have in general sat lower down than newer buildings. If you grew up in a new building, by the time you were old, uh, it would have gone from being one of the highest points in the landscape toward, to one of the lowest if you lived to an old age, uh, which most people didn't, to be fair. Um, some of them would have. When they built new houses, uh, most of the walls that they built out of mud brick at Chital are actually really quite flimsy in and of themselves. And the only way that they managed to stand uh, was by having effectively exceptionally deep foundations. And they did this by building on the stubs of walls of earlier buildings, uh, sometimes centuries earlier. Uh, so we'll see a, a case where this wasn't done later and it, it looks weird. Uh, but in general, buildings are kind of like nesting dolls, they're walls. So when you build a building in 6650, uh, its foundations are actually built 200 years previously uh, in 6850. Uh, and each new wall kind of incorporates all the walls below it. And so mechanically, their buildings depended on uh, historic things buried in the subsurface of their world. So there's a lot going on under the surface at Chital as they're living in it. Uh, and uh, a lot of that was kind of foundational, I mean, literally foundational to their buildings. It was uh, foundational to the lives that they were leading was that they lived on top of a pile of dead people and their stuff. Uh, but they didn't just live on top of dead people and old stuff, they also, were quite familiar with the fact that they were still there and went out of their way to go and re-encounter that stuff. Uh, so people regularly dug holes to reopen burials, retrieve skulls from them or other bones from them, add new people into old burials. Uh, they would retrieve buried sculptures like those horn pillars, dig a hole and, and pull one of those up and, and move it somewhere else. Uh, we'll see in a bit, they'll sometimes dig down and expose an entire buried wall uh, sometimes centuries buried, like had been under the surface for centuries. They'll re-expose a wall and build it into a new one. Uh, they'll retrieve timber posts supporting walls. So that's what's going on at the right here. Um, that's not, archaeologists didn't make that section. We're not that bad at it. Um, <laughs> that Neolithic people made that section to retrieve uh, some sort of timber feature that had been located next to this hearth. And in, in the process, they gave us a nice section of the hearth uh, and the floors around it. Uh, so it's not just that they were living on top of this stuff, they were probably very familiar with what it looked like to excavate uh, buildings that 
they had lived in as children, that their parents had lived in, things like that. And they're very, very precise in the way that they do it. So this is three burials. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one in almost an identical cut. Uh, we actually find this fairly frequently that you have an early burial that's kind of longer and then later burials specifically target uh, where the feet or maybe the pelvis were. Uh, and there's a whole sequence right there reopening the pretty much same exact grave cut uh, within a house. Uh, and, and this is again really very common and very striking that they were able to do this. So once they would buried someone plastered over that floor, uh, there's no real mark of where these people are, but clearly someone knows exactly where the bodies are buried, not just where the bodies are really, but where different parts of the bodies are. They can target a skull, they can target the feet. Which brings me to my last point about uh, practice at Chital, which is location really mattered to them and very specific details of where things were below their feet mattered. Uh, so on the left, this is a crawl hole between connecting two buildings. That building is lived in for a while. This crawl hole is filled in, covered up, it's invisible. Lived in more, torn down, abandoned for a while, rebuilt. And in the rebuilt building, they put this niche with two big cattle scapulae uh, flanking it in exactly the same spot, like directly vertically above the crawl hole. And I think they're probably uh, connected conceptually there. And in the top right, you have just a simple hearth that's been covered over by those rising plaster floors. And then at a later point, someone just drills down and leaves a little deposit of obsidian uh, smack in the middle of the hearth. Uh, again, it had been invisible for quite a long time, uh, but it seems fairly targeted. Uh, last one, this is uh, crazy. So what's happened here is a person's died. They've buried them. I think it's a older adult male, but I might be wrong about that. They buried them and yanked all the teeth out. Cover it over, live in the house, tear the house down, build a new house. Uh, and so we're right on top and in the exact spot in the new house where that person had been buried without their teeth, uh, they bury a little bag with the teeth and some other bones from some other people. But that person's teeth got yanked and then put exactly in the same X, Y coordinates uh, that they came from originally. So they have a real uh, We get a real sense that they care exactly where things are below their feet, uh, not just that things are buried, that they're past, that they're heirlooms. They know where those teeth came from, like to a, a few centimeters uh, precision. Uh, or at least they're capable of doing that. And so location in the subsurface below their feet actually matters to them. And so to sum all that up, uh, people are regularly participating in things like plastering over stuff and burying it uh, or digging stuff up and re-exposing old stuff. They're regularly participating in uh, the burial of spaces, of people, uh, and clearly at least some people are putting a lot of effort into remembering, remembering where stuff is. Some projects like staging a funeral or building a new house uh, have these really carefully choreographed moments where they're re-exposing an old burial and taking the skull, where they're re-exposing a wall that's been buried for 200 years, uh, where they're digging up a sculpture that's been gone for decades. Uh, where they're burying those teeth right where they belong. Uh, and so my sense is that people at Chital thought a little bit like archaeologists and that the past is down there and digging it up carefully is a way to activate it. Uh, all those layers following the cut of a previous grave. Um, you know, I've only seen two people, two types of people carefully, meticulously follow a grave cut and it's archaeologists and Neolithic people at Chattel Hayek. So uh, to wrap this up and to show how this sense of history kind of infuses not just really overtly history making activity at Chital, but also other parts of their lives. 
wanted to go to maybe my own story of material force, something a little bit like uh, Edgeworth's Wensbury excavations, uh, and talk about a, a search for a missing wall that we went on in 2017 at Chital, uh, why that wall was missing, because spoiler alert, some other people had excavated it a long, long time ago, uh, and how that points to the ways that the past was infused in their past at Chital in maybe specifically archaeological ways. So this is building 131, uh, and in 2017, we'd finished digging it. We'd gone through all the floors, all the features, through the foundation uh, packing, uh, and we were ready to take this building out and excavate the building underneath it. Usually this is a pretty straightforward process at Chital because they build the buildings one on top of the other. And so all you do is you yank out the walls of the later building and right below the foundations of them, you find the walls of the older building. Uh, and then you remove the rubble, and there you go, you start again on a new one. So we dug along the north end of building 131, found walls below it. The west side found the wall below that. Uh, south side found the wall below that. And then we came to the east side, and we hit this. The building just kind of stopped. The east wall of building 131 is just off the screen here to the left. Um, it actually had very clear open area surfaces and basically a, a well-tended midden underneath it. And so we are missing our eastern wall here. So we go down and there's still no wall. We go down further and further, and it's only as we start coming down on like, the floor and the features, the ovens, things like that in uh, the building below, what we'll call building 139. Uh, it's only as we got way down to the floors that we realized what had been going on. Uh, we could see it in the section then. Uh, you might not be able to. I don't think I have enough pixels to uh, make it very visible, but I've got a red line. This is what had happened. Uh, this is where the eastern wall of building 139 had been that we were looking for all that time. Uh, so there was a massive pit uh, dug to remove that wall sometime after it had been demolished and, and sat there a while. This is building 139 once we got it all cleaned up and you can see the bottom of that pit uh, coming down here and really carefully targeting that eastern wall uh, these are the upper courses of the wall have fallen into the house and, and nicely stuck together. That's you love to find that. Uh, but the lower courses of the wall would have been there standing about two meters high. Uh, and instead, someone's dug through and taken all of that out uh, down to in the middle of it. At least they got every last bit of the wall uh, up and out of there. So this is ultimately what we realized had happened. Uh, the building was imploded. Uh, the area was used as an open space, most likely for uh, decades, if not longer. Um, and that kind of eastern midden that you see over here just extended over where building 139 had been. And then when they decide they're going to build something new in this spot, they dig this massive pit. I mean, it took 10 of us three working days to uh, to excavate half of it. So I can only imagine what that was like with antler picks and, and without metal tools, basically. A uh, huge project to remove this eastern wall. Um, then they fill the pit back in. Uh, they do some interesting things that I'm about to talk about, and then they build building 131 with its wall extended way out here, uh, kind of capturing or annexing a big part of that open space. So we're back at our east wall of building 131, and when they start to build it, uh, now they're building in an unusual way for them, right? They're building on midden sediment. There's no wall below this one uh, to provide that really deep foundation. There's no history of architecture in this place. Uh, really very physically, there is no history of architecture in this place. So the first thing they place, uh, I don't know if you can see the difference, but these bricks over here are a completely different kind of brick from anything else in the building and we think they might be actually lifted from another structure somewhere else and placed under the southeast corner.
corner of the wall, which is then built on top of uh, that, if you will, token wall underneath. In the northeast corner, rather than bricks, what we get is a preterm neonate in a little wooden box uh, with a little shell lid uh, buried underneath the bottom course of bricks. Uh, this is actually really common with walls that are built on unstable footing at Chital, uh, walls that are in other ways structurally insecure. We find dead bodies, usually uh, very young bodies, uh, stuffed underneath the bottom of them. Uh, and I, I won't talk any more about it other than to plug this, which is just out this week uh, and goes into the whole story about why we find weird, uh, weird deposits of human beings underneath very specific kinds of walls with structural problems at Chital. So building building 131, this later building on this spot, uh, is a really transformative project. We're right at the peak of Chattel Hayek's occupation. There's very little open space. Uh, and they're taking what was an open space, probably shared between quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of households, quite a lot of groups of people, uh, and they're going to actually build a building there and and block off that open space uh, in a way. That's probably a very big change for the people living around that area in the site at that time. I think it's telling just to what lengths they go to engage that project, not just with building a building on top of this open space but also to engaging that building with things down below it. So they go to this massive effort to remove the east wall of building 139. And it's really difficult for me to understand any sort of kind of immediate practical value to that sort of uh, task. It's sometimes explained as, oh, they wanted to recycle bricks into new structures, but uh, if they wanted to recycle bricks from building 139, they had four walls kind of shallowly buried if they wanted to take the top courses. I don't see why you would target uh, one single wall for removal like that. Um, to my mind, it's actually more striking that they targeted the wall where the building on top wasn't going to match up with what had come before. Uh, and uh, my best guess as to why this has happened is there's some need for them to make what's on top match what's below. And if there's a mismatch, uh, suddenly we've got a couple dozen people with antler picks and digging up a wall from its roots, uh, spending quite a lot of time on it. Uh, the uh, east wall where they had a wall built on previously unbuilt space, uh, it's telling that that's where we get a lot of these special deposits, infants, uh, recycled bricks, things like that, uh, trying to give something like a history to that place. And that history needed to rest not just anywhere in the building, but specifically right below the problem spot. And so I think that building just captures for me a sense of how these people's very particular way, peculiar way even of thinking about uh, history, thinking about the past, thinking about the, relevant of the relevance of the past to things that we do or that they would do in their present uh, impacted almost any kind of project of spatial change on that mound. If you think about the surface as being, or the subsurface as being uh, inextricable from the history of a place, uh, then any project that needs to engage with the history of the place uh, will need to engage with uh, what is very specifically down there in that spot. Um, and this is a very different kind of history making than uh, we find in other places, other times in the past. Um, so yeah, uh, this is in many ways a, a wild set of ideas that I've been playing with for a long time to try to understand some very weird uh, behavior from Neolithic people. I never do run out of very weird behavior from them to try to uh, wrap my head around. Uh, but I think it gives us some things to think about when we start to think about the past in the past. What kind of past could they even have possibly had given the way that they engaged with the world? Uh, I think you would engage history differently if you think that it's something that's passed down through heirloom objects, for example, or if it's something that's uh, told through oral histories and, and authorized elders passing down knowledge of the past. You might never need to dig a pit 
to understand the past if the past comes from uh, authority figures in your life uh, and oral history and things like that. The only kind of, well, I'll say probably buried stuff didn't make much of a difference one way or another to the past of the Hellenistic people who plowed this foundation trench, cleaned through this Chattahoyak house, obliterated half of a bunch of uh, things and, and just really messed the space up. Uh, clearly, there are lots of ways to think about the past which don't cause you to hesitate as you dig a hole through a Neolithic house. Um, the not at all obvious thing that we do and the Neolithic people did was dig up old houses carefully. And so by specifying some of the fields of practice in which buried space mattered, uh, even when people weren't really thinking about uh, history, even when they were thinking about building a new house or the local politics of taking up new open space. Um, I think that's a crucial element that we need to add to the way that we deal with the past and the past, that it's not just the most striking examples. We've got plenty of striking examples, um, but it, that is also just as in our world, it's it's something that really infuses everything that they did. I'll leave that there. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I mean, probably death is one of the few places where most people engage in a lot of digging holes and sometimes digging them up. Uh, even people who would never, you know, who would never take care to excavate a house often will take care to dig a grave. Um, I don't know exactly if they thought about um, death as going to an inverted world or going somewhere down below. I mean, I'm pretty sure they thought about it as going physically down below them because they knew exactly where people were buried. Um, but actually, to my mind, the idea of uh, the underground being the afterlife kind of actually takes some of the material specificity away from the underground. Uh, if I had to guess, I, I really don't know what they thought, but uh, if I had to guess, I would say that it was a little bit more complicated than that for them, just like it is for like we would have trouble believing that uh, after death you live on underground, uh, even though we obviously bury our dead. Um, but that's because we have so much else happens underground for us and a lot happened underground for them too. Uh, but it's an interesting question. I would love to pick their brains about it. I've long said that people show me are the weirdest people of all prehistory, and this just confirms it. Um, I was thinking about the future aspects uh, of this wonderful talk, and, and thinking about some of these uh, practices that you mentioned, like the pulling of the teeth from one person, and then I don't know how much time has passed for that much to rise, but it's, I don't know, decades, presumably. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking about your question of futures, because Clearly, they are also planning to do something with those teeth, whether or not they were planning to do exactly what they did and put them in a bag and on the same spot, or whether those teeth were circulating in the community, or, you know, it's impossible to answer those questions. And what I was wondering was, so there's some hints that they are thinking about the future, but in the architectural terms that you're working with, are there any parts of the buildings where you can see that they're very much projecting some change that's going to happen with future buildings on top? Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so it's uh, that's part of my argument with the dead babies that end up in, in walls is that. Uh, I mean, actually, it, yes, so they're anticipating structural problems with those walls uh, and not all of them actually do develop structural problems, but by and large, they end up incorporating bodies into those unstable walls when they're built. And quite a lot of them go on to be a bit wobbly. Uh, and 
so I think a lot of this really does um, have to do with them thinking about because they foresee things going on in the future, that's why it needs the right sort of thing down below. I, ideally, an old wall that's been there for 200 years down below, but failing that, a dead kid uh, will do the trick. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I could go on and on about that because it you know, just had a paper out about it. But yeah, I think that uh, a lot of this kind of history making stuff is happening in activities that are really not necessarily about just uh, history making for its own sake. It's because people are trying to take up space in, in you know, really kind of precious open space that not, uh, there's not much of it going around and they're trying to take that and, and get rid of it and turn it into a house for some people. Uh, and that's when they start paying really close attention to history. It's because they're doing something controversial and, and trying to change the future uh, that they need to think really hard about how they engage with the past. Yeah. So a lot of these burials upon burials, has there, has there been any DNA studies to see if there's like any biological kinship or anything like that? Yeah, there's generally not, uh, is the picture we have. I mean, uh, so ADNA doesn't preserve well at Chital for various reasons. It's only recently that any has really come out. Uh, what we do have are really extensive uh, dental morphology studies, so looking for genetic traits of the teeth that would have been passed down. Uh, and in general, almost everyone's buried in a house. Uh, the people buried in a house together are no more likely to be close relatives to one another than they are to be close relatives to anyone in the general population. So the, yeah, the burial populations in houses have no real correlation with what we would think of as, as good Europeans with our ideas of blood descent or, or genetic kinship, uh, which is a very shocking result, but uh, good fun to think about, okay, how were they related to one another then if, if uh, genetic descent didn't matter. Can I just tag on to that? Uh, because it's so interesting to me that it would be so easy to think that they're thinking about history, but they're also thinking about the future and therefore they're, you know, trying to plan out the future for their king and for their lineage and for their households. But actually, a uh, genetic kinship doesn't seem to work. And I know, obviously, from your previous work that households don't really work at all either. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, they're very fluid, clearly, and they're thinking about how people are related to one another and to place. And, and it's this weird paradox that, on the one hand, they're so invested in history and so invested in stability. Uh, and yet, if you look uh, kind of just under the surface, there's also a lot that's very negotiable and very open for change uh, in the way that they live their lives. And so it's like there's these very specific things, like, say, walls, that have to be, you know, that they very rarely break precedent when it comes to walls, but they clearly break precedent all the time when it comes to who your mom is. Uh, and that's, that's uh, yeah, interesting, very interesting. There's a question. Yeah, uh, so a question from Hacker. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, you mentioned that people would open and dig up old burials, place new bodies, or even take the buried bodies out and place them elsewhere. What was the point of this practice um, of moving their ancestors around and moving them from their location? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a, a very unfamiliar thing. I think it's a very, a very common thing in quite a lot of prehistory to uh, dig people up, parts of people up and hang on to them. Certainly in, in British prehistory, it's kind of the norm almost for uh, some periods to uh, hang on to bits of people and turn them into flutes and things like that. Um, we don't have any femur flutes, uh, or is it, a, I think it's a tibia. Anyway, we don't have any people's legs turned into musical instruments yet. Uh, at Chital, but uh, certainly they are really invested in remembering where people are, digging them up, re reopening their grave, and sometimes, only sometimes, taking bits of them, other times adding bits of other people in. And so I think that we just have to start thinking about, well, two things. First, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't speak too flippantly about the dead. They, they do get restless. Uh, yeah, so we need to think about first uh, burial as not a not an end point in a process, but just as a starting point in someone's uh, someone's death. Uh, so uh, certainly people at Chital, uh, burial was just the beginning of, of what people do with your dead body, uh, and they will often be back and, and do things with you. So it's just a much longer term engagement with the dead body. Um, and the other thing I think we need to question is the idea of an individual. You, you talk about people having their location and I don't know that anyone had their location as such uh, that a group of other people couldn't claim their leg or something like that uh, away from them. I get the sense that sometimes you just needed uh, somebody's leg or foot or a dead, dead infant uh, to put under a wall, right? And maybe that's not really about that person. It's not about what the infant would want or whatever. Uh, it's about what a dead body can do for the living. And uh, that challenges a lot of our ideas, our ideas about what Yeah, the ghosts are <laughs> restless right now. Uh, yeah, Kevin, thank you for that. And um, I'm kind of interested in uh, kind of uncertain futures and what happens on the edges of those practices. Like, so you said, I mean, the Chatel Hugh obviously very long lived settlement changes shape over time. There are higher population, lower populations. And so, what happens when there are no there is no history to kind of dig or build on. Like, do you see any kind of changes in practice when people start building new houses? Are they looking for specific types of materials to build on? How much difference is there between a mud brick, brick and, the, and the substrate in which they're building anyway? Like, what are the material differences there? And do you see kind of material practices change when people have to start in a new place without any history? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, one thing that, let's see if I can, swing to it really quick. One thing that I kind of just didn't mention much when we get this is you see those history house stacks going up and up and up and then they stop going up and up uh, and, and all the buildings towards the top are just kind of swinging around uh, loosely. So something big definitely changes in the way that they think about space uh, right around the middle of the sequence. Uh, one of the things that we find in that later period where uh, you can see just all the sediments just kind of going all over the place is this phenomenon where they still build some history house sequences but most houses aren't that way and most houses are very short-lived and probably less than 10 years um, and those are shifting location all around the place um, they're probably not very stable at all because they don't have any sort of foundation to them uh, and then you get some sequences. The one with uh, the guy's teeth in them uh, is one of these uh, history house sequences that is out of out of its time, as it were. Like it's kind of and and one idea for how we think about this is that they hold on to some of these ideas, but they are now just only kind of a part of the community is doing that, or that's like the that's the stable spine of the community. And then everyone else kind of does their thing and mixes around and uh, finds more short term accommodation. So rather than everyone being in a really history saturated place, there are history saturated places and those are special. If that makes sense, most most places aren't like that. Um, and, and that's a real change. I think the really interesting thing about this earlier phase is uh, just that it's really difficult to say where the special houses are because they're all nuts. Uh, and then later on you get um, in some ways a much more natural dichotomy between the interesting and the boring <laughs> houses. Uh, so yeah, I don't know that that directly answers your question. It's definitely something that uh, puzzles me is how you go on with um, living in the, how you break that. 
reference point to what's down below. Um, and I think, and it, it does seem to happen quite quickly. There are things going on around that time in, in the region. Cattle are domesticated. Uh, you get settlements. Uh, that's when farming settlement suddenly becomes a uh, really expansive thing. Uh, and so it, it's very possible that there is kind of social upheaval. We get whole, whole neighborhoods like this one just abandoned all, all at once. Uh, so maybe that's enough to break that idea that you need to reference what's below you all the time. But yeah, it doesn't go away, but it becomes much more um, optional. Yeah, yeah. That's also when they start to do things like, uh, I don't know, just add some buttresses to your walls so they don't need uh, four meters of foundation to stand up. You can actually just build a wall better uh, and suddenly it's not as necessary. Um, but it's telling that they, it, they could do that earlier, but they chose not to. Are you are you finding the appropriate amount of graves? So are there any like for the population at the time of the house that you excavated so far, or do you feel like there are some graves missing so that there still might be an acropolis somewhere or a different treatment of some bodies? It's probably most of them and probably not all of them. So uh, it's a lot of people, I think. The Hodder project dug something like 60 houses deep enough to get to any of the burials and, and turned up about a thousand people. So that seems like a pretty good ratio. That said, some people are just like bits and pieces of people, or they're clearly like a bunch of bones that have been kept in a bag and they could have died somewhere else and been brought there. Um, there's probably no big necropolis on a hill somewhere uh, where lots of people are buried. There might well be little cemeteries out around where people who died out and about ended up buried, but for the most part, it seems like people tried to bury the dead in houses on the mound. We'll finish it there. Cool. So thank you again. Definitely really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you to everyone for attending online and in the room. Um, we will be carrying on to the pub now for further discussion if you'd like to join.